The price of Bitcoin is going to go up to $10 million a coin. The difference between 2% inflation or 2% deflection per year and 0% deflection or 0% inflation is the difference between an average life expectancy of 70 and immortality. What's the difference between perfect money and imperfect money? Perfect money is economic immortality. Imperfect money is we all have a short, brutal life. The Chinese will embrace Bitcoin. Name a company that's still in existence from 100 years ago off the top of your head where the stock is worth more today in real terms than it was then. What if I told you I could make your company live forever? When you have a need to know, when you have a crisis, if your country is in crisis, if your company is in crisis, if your family is in crisis, when the bank freezes and fails and the currency crashes and you have a business or you, or you have a life and you're in that culture, you have a need to know, your eyes are open, now you adopt Bitcoin. Trump has discovered Bitcoin, Trump has a need to know. Mike, I don't remember. When did we first meet? And, you know, and you'll say, well, you know, the first time we met, you kicked me out and told me I was a moron. And they're like, oh, I don't remember that at all. Did I do that? I'm sorry I did that. The difference between me swinging a baseball bat at your head while you're looking that way versus me doing this with a baseball bat saying, you should duck. I'm about to swing it, right? One of them is interesting. Maybe it's entertaining. And the other is brutal. Fire is scary. People run from the fire. Don't wave the fire in your sister's face. When Apple encounters Bitcoin, I think they may look at it and think, well, wait a minute, uh, Bitcoin, multi-signature, cloud. What if we actually make the Apple Watch a signing device and combine it with the iPhone and combine it with the third signing device on a laptop and then we do something with the cloud? Maybe the future biggest bank in the world is Apple Computer and Apple's going to give us easy to use safe multi-sig that's six-year-olds can figure out. How's Bitcoin going to scale? You're going to see a growth in layer twos, a growth in layer threes. You're going to see the transactions on layer one get bigger. The average transaction size is going to go to 2,000, then 20,000, then 200,000, then 2 million, then 20 million. Do you want the billion people in China to be rich? And do you want to be rich while the Chinese government still has a bunch of laws that you may or may not agree with? Or do you want the people in China to be poor and you to be poor while the Chinese government has a set of laws that you don't agree with. Do you think that you're so great, you're Superman, that you can just go and topple the entire government by barking on Twitter? How did Bitcoin change you? Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Uh, thank you for being on my podcast. Awesome. Happy to be here. It's actually my second in-person podcast ever. I have done 151 podcast episodes and you're my second one in person. I, I love that a lot. They're Thank a lot better in real life. Definitely a lot better. And I had totally different uh, questions planned and I just love the presentation you gave at Bitcoin Prague right now. Um, we are now at the Bitcoin Prague event. Uh, and I wanted to just start up with the income uh, that you gave, the entry in the presentation you gave about Bitcoin is the singularity where science collides with economics. And I needed to think about that a few times because before I like, oh, I, maybe I grasp what it is. Um, can we go deeper on that? Like, what does this mean uh, on, on many levels? What do you mean with that? The scientific method, the application of, of um, mathematics, uh, Disciplined logic, experimentation, engineering, um, trial and error. Um, if we think about the scientific method applied to astronomy, right? The, the, the Copernican revolution and the breakthroughs in astronomy, they came because of a new instrument, right? Advances in optics allowed us to create a telescope. And... Before the telescope, before that technology, if you will, for 100,000 years, human beings looked up in the sky and they imagined they understood what was going on. And then they filled in the blanks with, with their uh, superstition and their creativity and they had their fears and hopes and dreams and religion mixed in with, with observation. And they somehow got around to concluding that the universe revolved around the earth. And if anybody suggested the universe did not revolve around the earth, they were burned or canceled or ignored. 
And that's a horrific, you know, wrong theory, and it causes you to make lots of mistakes, mistakes in navigation, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, maybe you'll never be able to master concepts that would be critical to advancing the civilization. And the scientific revolution applied to astronomy started with the technology. When that telescope was created, we could see the moons of Jupiter. When we could see the moons of Jupiter, we could start to calculate the impact, uh, you know, of the moons of Jupiter, and we could correlate those those orbits to what we knew about Kepler's laws and mathematics. And somehow, mathematics and physics um, were impacted by uh, engineering and technology, and they resulted in a profound paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift was maybe the universe doesn't revolve around the earth. In fact, it seems quite obvious that that's not the way the universe works. And that catapulted us into an entirely new world. And what follows next is Newtonian physics. And after that, you know, the invention of, of all of the mechanisms that made civilization possible. Um, Economics is pseudoscience before Satoshi. It's, it's a quasi-religious uh, liberal arts, and it's full of people's opinions and prejudices and biases. And uh, in, the, in the absence of an instrument, and the instrument in this case is, is perfect money or proper money, if you don't have uh, an instrument of proper money that doesn't have deflection, then you can't posit a properly functioning economy. And so all of the economists before Satoshi, they were trying to work out the laws of economics with seashells and glass beads and pieces of paper and, and, uh, and credit instruments. And, and those are all imperfect instruments, right? They're, they're so imperfect, you could never create a beautiful or a perfect mechanism. Um, and in the absence of the ability to manufacture the perfect mechanism, you can't, uh, you can't move forward uh, with uh, scientific advance. So when I say, uh, you know, Bitcoin is singularity where science collides with economics, I mean that we invented an instrument. And the instrument was, you know, it's a combination of, it was the math of cryptography, it was the engineering and the manufacturing of semiconductors. It was the computer science of the internet. And when you put the internet and semiconductors and you put cryptography together with a few, a few insights, you can create this mechanism that, that we call Bitcoin. And that, and that becomes uh, a mechanism uh, to keep true track of money, to, keep, to, to measure true money. When I say it like that, it reminds me of, of um, another great scientific revolution. It was John Harrison's invention of the clock. And, and, you know, and, and the perfect uh, maritime clock that could be used to calculate longitude on the, on the ocean. Right before Harrison's clock, there was no there's no way to calculate longitude. Before longitude, we didn't know where we were on the on the sea. It was a profound breakthrough in the history of navigation. It was made possible by Harrison's clock, and Harrison's clock was a a mechanism so per precise that you could keep track of tr universal time. What we what we called Greenwich Mean Time. Mm. Now it's UT. UTE or universal time, and um, and once you had a mechanism precise enough to keep track of time in Greenwich at the Royal Observatory, you could put it on a ship and you could you could uh, compare it to a second clock which kept track of local time, and subtracting the one from the other and multiplying by fifteen degrees per hour gave you a longitude. So. Science advances with the arrival of a certain instrument. Until, until you have that instrument, for 100,000 years, you can't calculate longitude. 
right? Until you have the telescope for 100,000 years, you can't see the moons of, moons of Jupiter and you can't figure out Kepler's laws really work. You just can't. You could pause it, but you can't prove. Before cryptography and the internet and modern semiconductors, you couldn't create a Bitcoin. If you can't create a Bitcoin, you can't create perfect money. If you don't have perfect money, then you can't actually posit an economy where the money doesn't deflect, where the money is true. When the money becomes true, the money is, is the asset which is used to channel capital through time and space, right? The essence of economics is, is the proper allocation of capital. And so, so Satoshi gave us a perfect money. The perfect money made it possible to capture, to store, to channel, to distribute capital, to program capital in an economy. And how profound is that? Well, I mean, the difference between 2% inflation or 2% deflection per year and 0% deflection or 0% inflation is the difference between an average life expectancy of 70 and immortality, mm. right? We figured out how not to die, right? It's pretty profound, right? When you think about it like that, perfect, what's the difference between perfect money and imperfect money? Perfect money is economic immortality. Imperfect money is we all, we all have a short, brutal life right? Terminated early. There's a time, a time when there's a 40% infant mortality rate between the age of zero and five, right? Your kids are going to die. There's a time when the, the likelihood that a woman giving birth dies in childbirth was like 30%, right? You know, before, before science crashed into medicine, you know, your children were more likely than not to die, <laughs> You know, your wife was more likely than not to die in childbirth. If you got her pregnant three times, it was a death sentence. And so you, you think about life before science impinged on medicine, pretty big deal. You think about science impinging upon, upon astronomy, a pretty big deal. Science, you know, blasting into navigation, right? Pretty big deal. And now science colliding with economics, Pretty big deal. Yeah, it's for me also fascinating. I asked that question so many times on my podcast, like how does Bitcoin change things? Like how does Bitcoin change society on a big uh, level? And you all say also in the presentation, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. And you also say like paradigm shift uh, that Bitcoin is. And now also like the, it, it changes the way we interact with, with uh, so many things. How? How different will be a, a world when we lo uh, look out like 50, 100, maybe even like a thousand years where we have this sound money on a digital realm, uh, all of the sudden this perfect money. How different is world and how, how, what is possible on, on, on that scale? I, I think if you look at uh, economic creatures, the, the classic economic creature in modern society is the corporation the average life expectancy of a corporation is something like 10 years. You create a company and it lasts more than 10 years, then you've lived longer than most. The number of, um, of corporations that are more than 100 years old, mm. right? What percentage of people live to be more than 100? Like 0.1% or 0.01%. What percentage of corporations live to be more than 100? 0.01%. Oh, oh, one percent. Well, what if I told you I could make your company live forever? Right? It's so how how profound. We're talking about we're talking about uh, eliminating corporate mortality, right? We're we're talking about stretching economic vitality easily by a factor of 10, maybe by a factor of 100, maybe by a factor of a million. Um, so, you know, how will it change society? Well, it won't change society uniformly the same everywhere. It's like, 
you know, Gibson says uh, the future is already with us, but it's not evenly distributed, right? In the modern world today, there are people in New York City that live in skyscrapers up 80 floors, and there are people that live in Africa in mud huts, you know? And you can find certain peoples that are still stuck in Neolithic Stone Age cultures if you look hard enough. And you can find people that if the electricity was turned off to their elevator, they die, right? And so very, very, very profound difference. I think um, you got to look at, um, at Bitcoin is this pure digital capital which means it's, it's the technology to capitalize a, a family, capitalize an individual, capitalize a corporation, capitalize an institution, a charity, a nonprofit, or uh, a country, or a city, so, or, or a university, right? I, you know, we, we throw away the, the word, throw around the word capitalize as a colloquialism, like, oh, you're going to capitalize on that? Okay, but if you think, and, and that's because economics has been pseudoscience and capital, capital has been kind of, a, you know, a liberal arts, arts type word. If you walked up to people on the street and said, what do you think capital is? And you asked them before Satoshi or before then it said Bitcoin. It's not clear what they would give you as an answer. They would, you know, say something about Karl Marx said it was bad or capitalists to do something with it. But it, it's such a such a fuzzy word. But uh, in the aftermath of Bitcoin, capital is economic energy, and I give you an asset to store economic energy. And and uh, now, if I can store economic energy in a digital asset, I can move the capital potentially at the speed of light at high frequency so I can move it through space, right? Can you actually oscillate capital at 10 megahertz? Mm. You can oscillate, you know, you can, you can create a, a, a 10 megahertz signal, right? 10 kilohertz signal you could probably hear, right? So at certain frequencies when you're, when you're vibrating uh, energy, right? you get a, a result. Capital's never been uh, something we could work with, we could program. So Bitcoin allows you to program and channel capital through time and space. And uh, in time, it, you know, it means that we have the hope of addressing things like global payments for, uh, for 8 billion people at the speed of light off of mobile phones with no intermediary, right? So that, that's interesting. How how do I actually do 100 transactions a second if I'm an AI bot and I want to trip through cyberspace, right? I mean, uh, that's interesting. You won't do that without digital energy or digital capital. But the other issue is, well, how do you actually send uh, a bunch of capital forward in time 100 years, right? And there's, you can't do it with gold. You can't do it with a building. You can't do it with a share of stock. I mean, name a company that's still in existence from a hundred years ago, off the top of your head, where the stock is worth more today in real terms than it was then. It'd be kind of challenging, right? So, so projecting economic energy through time and space has really been more of um, of an aspirational fantasy right, or an art than it was ever a science or engineering discipline. Bitcoin, uh, it, it takes something from the artistic and from the religious and from, and from the political domain, and it moves it into the engineering domain where now there is actually a precise way to move capital around, to store capital, to capitalize. You know, and I, I guess your question is, how will the world change profoundly, right? I mean, I can create an AI that can live in cyberspace capitalized by Bitcoin that will live forever, that will have economic mortality that is, uh, that is completely uh, sovereign from a company, a person, a country. That AI could, in theory, split itself you know, go viral and spawn 10 million more AIs that are all sovereign. Mm -hmm. It's a life form, right? It's 
right? Uh, I could uh, end. I can endow a, a, a university, a nonprofit, a foundation with Bitcoin that could perceive, uh, con uh, conceivably last a thousand years without anybody working for it, right? I can, I can create new types of entities. I can create companies that don't have a life expectancy of 10 years, and I, I can create a company with a likely life expectancy of 100 or 500 or 1,000 years. I can have different missions. I can think differently about how I capitalize or finance my country. I think think differently about uh, how I build every product and service could be different, right? If you think about products that are around us all all the time, you know, life insurance products or or any kind of annuity products, all of those things, right, will be disrupted. Maybe they'll be dematerialized. Mm. Right? There's a uh, there's an entire industry that shuffles around $400 trillion of assets. So we have $400 trillion of 20th century analog assets that are inefficient, that are toxic, that are dilutive. And those are handled by a massive financial establishment that's inefficient, right? And so you have a very inefficient establishment handling inefficient assets, trading them back and forth inefficiently, you could obliterate it all. You could just replace it all with just, I have Bitcoin, I hold it. I don't need the establishment. I, I don't need the bank to hold it. I don't need the Wall Street firm to trade it. I don't need to trade it. I don't need to diversify across, like why do I buy the S&P 500 index? Why do I have to buy 500 different companies when I know that most of them are not even that good or that successful, but I have an entire entire financial infrastructure to to trade and rebalance inferior assets as a store of value. What if you just obliterate it all? Mm. Right? Maybe it all just goes away. So I think the world changes, but it'll, it'll change in every sector, in every part of the world at a different rate, depending upon politics, depending upon leadership, depending upon culture. And there'll be profoundly beautiful things that'll be created that you could have never created before. There'll be terrifying things that'll be created that no one conceptualized before. And there'll be parts of the world where they do it the same way in 50 years they did it 30 years ago, I suppose. Mm. This also brings me to a question that I planned before I um, ha saw your presentation uh, about global game theory right now. Uh, we have in the US election is already Bitcoin a big topic with uh, Trump uh, accepting it, Trump speaking about it. EU election, I saw the Austrian view of it uh, and I never heard any word of Bitcoin, crypto or anything of that. So in, in the EU, it seems to be... Uh, non-topic till now at least like not a uh, public topic like in in the american elections how do you see right now the global game theory with like uh, el salvador as a small country that go goes like bigger steps america making it more uh, um, more a uh, topic and then you india china uh, how do you see the global game theory right now bitcoin insight is restricted to those with a need to know mm. i love that rule when you have a need to know, when you have a crisis, if your country is in crisis, if your company is in crisis, if your family is in crisis, when the bank freezes and fails and the currency crashes and you have a business or you, or you have a life and you're in that culture, you have a need to know, your eyes are open. Now you, now you start to take Bitcoin seriously. Now you adopt Bitcoin. Trump has discovered Bitcoin, Trump has a need to know, right? El Salvador, their currency crashed, you know, they had a need to know. I think people in, in countries like Lebanon, right? They don't have a reliable banking system, they have a need to know. Um, in, uh, in places where the society is affluent and the leaders are affluent and they feel comfortable and they don't feel threatened or challenged, if they're comfortable in their political um, standing, if they're not afraid of being, uh, being driven out of office, they don't have a need to know. 
if if they're not insecure about their currency, if they're not insecure about their banks, they don't have a need to know. Right? In those cases, they'll be the latest, the last to embrace Bitcoin or to appreciate it because they don't have a need to know. But the world's full of places that where you do have a need to know. And it's not just places, but it's peoples, right? The minority out of power, right, who are disenfranchised, who are disinherited, right? They used to say about America, right? Who, who settled in America? It was the second sons. <laughs> It was the, the, the second son to settle in America. The first son inherited the family estate in Europe, and the second son wasn't going to inherit anything. And so if the second son wanted property, a future, hope, they got on a ship, they crossed the ocean at great peril to themselves because there was an entire continent where they might actually get a start and they might have a chance. The second sons had a need to know. And I think Bitcoin is a great equalizer in that regard. You know, the wealthy, affluent, comfortable won't have a need to know. They will be blind to it. And those who are disenfranchised, who are, you know, who are looking for a better future, they will be, they are the hopeful ones, but they're also the seekers, the searchers, right? They're, they're going to look, they're going to find it. They are finding it. Hundreds of millions are finding it. They'll embrace it. They'll benefit from it. The rest of the world over time will discover it when they have a need to know. And that's why I also love to, uh, I think it was the last rule even uh, where we spread Bitcoin with love and not hate uh, because I was also in that time where like this toxic maxi like, oh, you have to get Bitcoin. Like you have to do it. But in the last half year, year, I kind of transfer to like, oh, if you're here, if, if you have questions, I'm here for the community. I'm here for everyone who has questions and want to learn more about Bitcoin and I help you. Uh, and that I, I love that um, I rule a lot. And how, how did you come to, to that rule uh, to, to spread Bitcoin with love and not hate? And also it kind of ties to the other rule with fear, uh, not, not against fear, but for Bitcoin. Well, um, it comes from a, a variety of, of different sources. My experience in business as a salesperson, and, and I've had thousands of salespeople that I've worked with or have worked for me over time, I've noticed the great ones, they go and they offer, they offer the customer something and the customer tells them to get out. They're stupid, they're foolish, the product stinks, they don't want it, they don't need it. Right, really good salespeople, they smile. <laughs> they say, I understand. I'm here. I'm here if things change. <laughs> Call me if you need me. You know, I understand you don't have a need right now. Thank you for your time. <laughs> But here's my card. Should should circumstances change, we'll be we'll be there. And when I when I was young, my first reaction was if the customer said they didn't want to buy or they they criticized my product, I would get angry at them and say they're stupid. But if you but if you go to a, a a big there's a phrase the customer is always right. Mm -hmm. If you go to a big rich customer, whatever it is, you know, and and they say your product stinks and you know reactions, well, you're too stupid to appreciate it. Years will go by. They'll you know the existing thing they're using will break. They will need your product. They don't. They won't remember whether they were mean to you. They will definitely remember if you said something mean to them. So if you actually got in a fight with them the first time around, then they'll just remember that you were rude to them. They won't call you back. They'll go to vendor B or vendor C or vendor D. So it's very bad game theory, you know, to tell the customer they're wrong, especially when they're wrong. If the customer is rude to you, you don't get rude back. You smile. You take your beating. The customer is always right, and you just stay ever-present in a cheerful, constructive way because over time, that sales behavior is the behavior that wins you the customer, and eventually you'll have a lot of happy customers, and they'll all kind of laugh, and, and, and they'll say, oh, you know, 
Mike, I don't remember. When did we first meet? And, you know, and you'll say, well, you know, the first time we met, you kicked me out and told me I was a moron. And they're like, oh, I don't remember that at all. Did I do that? I'm sorry I did that, you know. <laughs> like, and that's the story of life with all salespeople everywhere. It's like, so think like a salesperson. Of course, they don't appreciate what you have to offer when they first hear about it because people's natural reaction is always to reject the new. Uh, you know, another experience I have is just looking at, you know, behaviors on social media like Twitter. Someone posts, uh, you know, I don't get Bitcoin. It seems stupid to me. It's probably bad for the U.S. or bad for the euro or bad for China or bad for whatever. You know, if your response is, you know, your response is, well, you're just too stupid to appreciate it and I hope you never buy it. Okay, well... What you've done is you've just vented frust frustration. It's a weakness. It, it, it sends a message of immaturity. And then the people that are fans of that person, the people that are followers of them, they don't know what they think one way or the other. All they know is you are mean to someone they liked. So when your favorite celebrity gets attacked by someone for not understanding Bitcoin, People are like, I don't know about Bitcoin, but I know I like my, you know, favorite actor or actress or singer. Mm -hmm. So you alienate their followers because of your attitude. You don't, you know, by being angry or hateful. So hate never works. You're not going to change their mind. All you're going to do is swing a bunch of, of observers on the fence to take the point of view that – you're just irritating. And, and at some point they just think, well, you might be right, but I don't like you. So I don't, you know, I don't care if you're right. I just don't like, you're just not a nice person. And so there's a lot of people in the world that are neutral and their view is they just don't want to buy from a person they don't like, whether you're right or, or not. If you understand sales over time, you realize that if you had a cure for cancer and the customer is dying of cancer. They still aren't going to buy the cure from you unless you're charming. You package it appropriately. You knock on their door 10 times. You explain to them how it's going to save their life. You listen to them yell at you. You let them vent. You sit through their temper tantrums. You find them financing for the cure to cancer. <laughs> You let them disparage you, your dog, your family, your color scheme, your logo, and you come back. And after about the 19th time, they'll be like, oh, you have to care to my cancer? <laughs> oh, okay, I'll take that. But you, you, have to, you have to sell it. You can't just think that, you know, I'm brilliant, I invented the solution, so therefore they should just immediately acknowledge my brilliance and take this gift I gave them. That's just not the way the world works. And, and if you have that attitude, you're just always going to be disappointed. You, know, mm -hmm. you As a salesperson, you would fail, right? And, uh, and so I think, I, I think we're introducing a new idea. If someone is open-minded, you introduce the idea. If they react negatively, you know, you can't disagree with them head on. You can't take a head-on fight. What you can do is perhaps introduce a different idea, a 90-degree oblique idea, you know, like, I, you know, I see you think blah, blah, this is bad for one of your constituents, but it would be really good for another one of your constituents. Right? Maybe you hate those people on Wall Street, but this will be good for the people that you want to help. Right? You can introduce a new idea, and then you just have to gra gracefully withdraw and wait for, for them to have a need. And you just keep yourself in the game, right? I, I love it so much because I think this is the one thing that can actually everybody can do. And we can actually accelerate Bitcoin adoption uh, because if you are the one, like I always do it like that when someone comes to me with Bitcoin and they're negative about it, like I'm always, um, I'm, I'm not responding badly about it. I'm just listening uh, and they will come again because they, they see Bitcoin in the news, they see, uh, come with Bitcoin and, and they come again. And what I'm curious about and you, and this was the one question that was in my mind when I heard the presentation, um, and you said, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. For me, it's really um, 
not quite that because I'm so young. Uh, so I got Bitcoin with 21. So it's like I was I was nobody with 21, and I got Bitcoin. So like I just developed my character. Uh, but with you, you got Bitcoin uh, at a later stage in your life. Uh, so you already had a lot of uh, experience. How did Bitcoin change you, if at all? Well, first, first we. Um, we were looking for a defensive strategy, right? And so my first experience with Bitcoin was, this was a defensive treasury strategy I could use to save my company. And, um, and so I studied enough to conclude I could, I could buy it. And, I, and so after I did that, I realized, wow, there's a lot more to Bitcoin than just digital gold, just making a digital technology investment. And so I started, I started actively researching. So one way Bitcoin changed me is it had me go down the rabbit hole and I started studying economics, Austrian economics, right? Bitcoin led me to read Murray Rothbard, you know, a history of economic thought and to read Conceived in Liberties. And then it led me to go back and read all of reread all of world history, and then it led me into a thousand podcasts, and then it led me to you know to listen to to listen to dozens of podcasts, uh, you know, on Bitcoin development and study the Bitcoin wars, and then start thinking about, and then it led me to think about the rest of the crypto industry, and then it led me to to you know go back and listen to every word uttered by Gary Gensler you know in a class he taught at MIT 2 years before I even knew about I cared about bitcoin and pretty soon you're reading you're reading books you wouldn't expect to read you're reading every bill about the crypto industry going through congress so it sucked me into um into uh the state of being a student again and most of the time, you think once you're past the age of 20-something, you're not a student anymore, right? You don't need to be a student. And Bitcoin taught me that I really needed to go back and relearn everything. I needed to relearn economics. I needed to relearn politics. I needed to relearn you know, technology. And, then I needed, and that led me to go back and look at my own company again and say, maybe I need to rethink how we're going to use this. And that led us to issuing convertible bonds to buy Bitcoin. And that led us to thinking about issuing equity to buy Bitcoin. That led us to thinking, well, we really, it's not enough that we learn how to do it. We need to educate other corporations on how to do it. When I discovered Bitcoin or, or when I first bought Bitcoin, I was ready to retire. I thought I had, you know, I had served more than 30 years as a public company CEO. I thought, you know, I have nothing left to prove in the world. You know, there's not much for me to do. I'll just go ahead and retire and gracefully disappear from history. <laughs> and Bitcoin plopped itself into my life and first teased me and then seduced me. And then it dragged me onto that stage today. Right. And so I was dragged onto our world stage and I found myself now instead of quietly retiring, um, I was now drawn into a role of advocacy such that I would get on a plane and fly to Sao Paulo or fly to Uruguay or or fly to Prague, or, you know, or, and, and obsess over things that I never need to obsess over and go back on CNBC or go on Fox, go on television and, you know, and, and or sit down and record thousand hours of podcast. And these are all things that I discovered late in life. I would say I'm a late bloomer, right? <laughs> like I'm much older than the average Bitcoiner, right? And, and so it's like, how did this all happen? And I think it's Bitcoin inspired me, may, maybe inspired me, catalyzed me. So it, it changed how I spend my time. It's, you know, it, it changed my intellectual interest. It changed our corporate strategy and it gave me a mission and I felt compelled to do it, right? Bitcoin serves us all up a mission if we listen carefully to what it has to tell us. 
I love it a lot. Um, from all those rules, 21 rules that you uh, presented at Bitcoin Prague, what is the favorite one? Like if you had to pick one uh, and, and why is it that? I mean, I think the most important one is the final one, spread Bitcoin with love, right? B Bitcoin is the solution to 8 billion people's problems. Bitcoin is, is the transformation of capital from analog to digital. Bitcoin is the singularity that brings science to economics. Bitcoin is instrumental for the human race uh, to reach its full potential. If we're going to 10x and 100x or 1000x from here, we can't do it without mastering this sort of digital capital, right? Without mastering digital energy. And, um, and so we need to spread it to the world. Whenever something moves faster than, uh, than the environment can adjust, we get a phenomenon known as a shock wave. When I move faster than, fa through air faster than the rate at which the air can get out of the way, right? The rate at which the air moves or the air communicates with itself is called the speed of sound. <laughs> it's literally the speed of sound. The reason that the sound moves that fast, that's how fast the air is carrying it, right? So when I move faster than the speed of sound, I create a shock wave. When I create a shock wave, there's just sound and fury and a, a atomic, you know, a, a sonic boom and turbulence. And uh, it's very disruptive. It's very painful, right? And so Bitcoin is that shock wave moving through the civilization. And on one hand, we feel impelled to spread it, to share it with our friends, with our family, with our corporation, with our country, with our politicians, with our intellectuals, with our leaders. We need to share it. But nobody likes being slammed into, you know, at supersonic speed. You know, not, that's painful. It's, a, it, it's the difference between going below the speed of sound and going faster than the speed of sound is the difference between me, you know, swinging a baseball bat at your head while you're looking that way versus me doing this with a baseball bat saying, you should duck, I'm about to swing it, right? <laughs> One of them is interesting, maybe it's entertaining, and the other is brutal. And so if we're going to do this, we need to do it with love, not hate. We can't hate people because they reject, because they resist, because they don't get it, right? Uh, we shouldn't. We shouldn't think, you know, that... Um, we need to hate the banks because they don't custody Bitcoin or hate your government because they don't embrace Bitcoin or hate your boss because the company doesn't buy Bitcoin, right? That, it's a natural reaction, but it's an immature reaction. What we ought to think is they're going to need it. They don't understand it. It's understandable they don't understand it. It's the most shocking economic thing that's happened in their life. Maybe it's the most shocking thing to happen in economics in 100,000 years. It's a fire raging. Fire is scary. <laughs> People run from the fire. Don't wave the fire in your sister's face, mm. right? Don't set your family on fire, mm. right? Ha ha have a little bit of consideration there, right? with such a powerful idea. So I think the world's a better place if we spread Bitcoin, but I think we got to do it with love. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keeps supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21 Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure 
secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. I also see that approach that uh, you just described you did with MicroStrategy and you'd explained it uh, in a lot of interviews how you like came up with like, uh, I want to introduce Bitcoin to MicroStrategy. Uh, and now you talk about Bitcoin, you invest in Bitcoin and now with MicroStrategy Orange, you also want to build with Bitcoin. Um, and I asked before this interview uh, online on Twitter, like what is the question for Michael Saylor? What, what should I ask him? There are a lot of responses, but one of the most common ones was like, what's the future of MicroStrategy? And with that also, what's the future of Bitcoin scaling, layer two, layer three technology? And, and what do we all build on, on, on Bitcoin? Well, MicroStrategy is going to continue uh, to raise capital to buy Bitcoin. We're going to continue to engage in Bitcoin advocacy uh, efforts to advocate Bitcoin institutional adoption for institutional investors. We're going to advocate adoption of Bitcoin by companies, both public companies and private companies. We're going to work on advocating and educating organizations on implementing Bitcoin treasury strategies. We're going to spend a lot of time advocating to get um, all the financial institutions in the world to embrace and adopt Bitcoin. We're going to um, continue to develop software. We've got great business intelligence software and thousands and thousands of very loyal customers. We're enhancing that with digital intelligence, what you'll call AI. So that's an obvious thing for us to do in our core business. But uh, we also have R&D efforts in, the, in uh, the Bitcoin business where we we focus upon uh, developing applications or integrating things like Lightning to see where we can, how we might provide that sort of service to enterprises. And we work on ideas like enterprise identity. Is there a way for us to combine public private key cryptography and digital signatures and the Bitcoin network with enterprise security and cybersecurity and, and, uh, and anti-fraud, anti-phishing, you know, type software. So those are, that'll all keep us busy. And uh, each one of those things is something that uh, just takes a lot of time and sensitivity to work out. But that doesn't really address your second question, which is the bigger and more important question. How does Bitcoin scale? And I think uh, the answer to that question is Bitcoin scales in myriad ways. Uh, to say thousands of ways might be an understatement, maybe tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of ways. There are 8 billion people on the planet and every single one of them that encounters Bitcoin is going to think about how they wish to interact with Bitcoin and they've all got a different opinion. The three-year-old that, that is interested in Bitcoin will have a different view than a 15-year-old will have a different view than a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old, an 85-year-old in China will have a different view than a 92-year-old person in Russia. And they will have a different view than someone in the United States in their mid-60s. And their views will be different depending upon your religion, you know, whether, you know, what your sect is, what your profession is, what your physical capabilities are. And so there's going to be a lot of views there. Then there's 330 million companies in the world. And you know a few of them. Um, there's Apple. When Apple encounters Bitcoin, and they're one of the more important companies in the world, a billion people rely upon them. When Apple encounters Bitcoin, I think they may look at it and think, well, wait a minute, uh, Bitcoin, multi-signature, cloud. What if we actually make the Apple Watch 
a signing device and combine it with the iPhone and combine it with the third signing device on a laptop. And then we do something with the cloud and Apple becomes a bank that has hundreds of billions of dollars of assets in it. And we secure that via the Apple cloud. And I suppose if Apple does that, then Google will take a different view. Well, we don't want Apple to do that. We want that to be done in Android. And at some point, Samsung will say, well, wait a minute, Samsung phones are used for Android and we can put the secure element in that and we'll take a different view. And at some point, you're going to have Qualcomm say, well, wait a minute, we provide the chips that are used in these phones and maybe our chip, maybe it ought to have a Bitcoin miner in it or maybe our chip ought to have a secure element to store your cryptographic keys so that our chip can be the right signing device. And then you're going to have all the Chinese companies and, and the Chinese government will say, well, you know, maybe we don't want Apple and Google to do this and we want our companies, Huawei, to do this. And so you're going to have, you're going to have governments that will take a view. You're going to have companies that are going to take a view. You're going to have other companies like Block and Block is going to say, well, we want to be better than Apple or Google and so... Block will ship the BitKey and Block will embed Bitcoin support into Cash App. And Block will do that in the United States. But Block doesn't operate in China. And there's going to be a company in China and they're going to think, well, maybe we'll just copy what Block does and we'll just do it in China. And that's going to work for them because the Chinese government's probably going to make it very difficult for an American company to do what American companies do in China. So then there's going to be some people that are going to say, well, I don't want to trust a company. Okay, well, you know, the, when you actually buy a coal card or you buy a treasure or a ledger, you're trusting a company. So what do you mean by not trust a company, right? Well, I'm not going to trust a company to store my keys. Well, so what are you going to do? I'm going to... I'm going to buy one of those uh, steel plate, titanium plates and I'm going to hammer my keys on the titanium plate. Okay, well, how's that going to get shipped to you? Well, I'm going to FedEx that. You're going to trust that company, right? I'm going to put it in a bank, safe deposit. That's another company, right? There's going to be a whole set of people. They'll take a view that I don't trust that company, but I'll trust this or I'll trust myself. And that's going to evolve. Right, I, I actually think, um, how does Bitcoin scale? You know, what you're gonna end up with is a, a set of entities that, uh, that self-custody on the base layer, um, the OGs, you know, Bitcoin maximalists, especially the ones with large amounts of Bitcoin and they will self-custody. Then you will see um, a set of Bitcoin banks. Cash App is the Bitcoin bank. Fidelity and Coinbase will be Bitcoin banks. Standard Charter and other custodians, Nidig and Anchorage, they will be Bitcoin banks. You'll probably see 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 Bitcoin banks, and they will be exchanges, custodians, they'll start to offer other services, maybe trading, maybe yield, maybe credit, or maybe just maybe just uh, buy, sell, and custody. But you'll see them, and then, you know, how will the scale, well, you'll, you know, you can send Bitcoin cash tag to cash tag right now, and it's instant and free, and you'll see a lot of that layer three custodial transactions going on. But when there's 50,000 or 100,000 Bitcoin banks, they will want to transact high speed with each other, but they probably won't go to the base layer. They'll probably go to a layer two, maybe a lightning. And so you'll see, you'll see a lot of layer two protocols, lightning being the obvious one where people open up channels and you'll see a layer three to a layer three do high frequency final settlements or, or settlements with a layer two. Maybe I want to do 100,000 transactions an hour, you know, in a channel system between 42,000 counterparties or, or 11,000 or something. So I think you're going to see um, a growth in layer twos 
a growth in layer threes. You're going to see layer. You're going to see um, the transactions on layer one get bigger. I, I mean, I don't think the Bitcoin scales by twenty-two dollar transactions. You know, half the transaction, the, the average transaction size is going to go to two thousand, then twenty thousand, then two hundred thousand, then two million, then twenty million. Maybe at some point you'll see, you know, the smallest transactions are, you know, million fiat terms. I mean, in Bitcoin terms, who knows? But, but you'll see uh, the transactions get much larger on the base layer. You'll see the fees will go up. The block rewards will go down. Right? The, um, there'll be an explosion in layer two options. There'll be an explosion in layer three options. One day you'll get to the point where, you know, if everybody with an iPhone can buy, sell, and send Bitcoin instantly on the iPhone, right? You might see a billion transactions a day on that layer three network. And, and how will that integrate with Google and everything else? Who knows? I think there'll be layer fours. One way that um, the Bitcoin is scaling right now is with the ETFs. So what is an ETF? You know, an ETF is wrapped Bitcoin in a way. It's like I can, I can send you a share of iBit and they're moving 500 million to a billion dollars a day in transaction fees. So you're, you're talking $250 billion or $300 billion a year in transactions in the IBIT network. Okay, so if I said I got an app and people are going to do $300 billion of payments on it, you would think that's scaled. Well, you know, it is scaling. You know, and people would say, well, some people don't like certain types of scaling. They'll be like, I, you know, there are Bitcoiners that don't like the idea that, uh, that there's money flowing into ETFs. But what I would say is 95% of the economic benefit from the arrival of the ETFs has gone to the Bitcoiners that don't have ETFs, that don't, that disagree, right? If you disagree with the ETF, if you think that's a bad idea and you didn't buy one, you made 20 times as much money in the last five months as the people that disagree with you and bought the ETF. So if your enemy just, just gave you 20 times as much as they just got and everybody benefited, are they really your enemy? Right? That, it doesn't seem like it, right? Bitcoin went from... 30,000 to 65, 70,000, all the people that don't like the ETFs are the beneficiaries. 95% of the Bitcoin isn't in the ETFs. In fact, in fact, if you look very closely, I think, um, yeah, there's maybe a million Bitcoin in the ETFs, but there were 650,000 Bitcoin in Grayscale before the ETFs. So there's probably only net 1% 1% of the Bitcoin has net flown into flowed in the ETF, but the price of Bitcoin double, which is worth $700 billion. So if I were looking at that, I, I could say, well, it looks like $693 billion of economic energy went to people that hate the ETFs because of the ETFs, right? So you see, it's not something to fear. Yeah. Right, not not on a not on a basic level, but they would say, "But wait a minute, they're centralizing." Well, one percent, one percent of the Bitcoin supply is is it really centralized? One percent is split between thirty four e thirty three ETFs that didn't exist other than Grayscale. So there was Grayscale that had six hundred fifty Bitcoin, and now there's thirty four ETFs, and they've actually decentralized because most of the Bitcoin in Grayscale went into BlackRock and Fidelity and other places. So. So, um, you know, it's one of the reasons I say you need to be humble. Don't, don't think you understand Bitcoin better than Bitcoin because it's not clear to me that the ETFs aren't decentralizing the network. What's happened with uh, the ETFs is they've massively scaled it. They've driven the trading 
of Bitcoin, the transactions up, they've drawn huge pools of capital into the network. They have normalized it. They've created lots of political support for Bitcoin. Um, and they solve, um, they solve a bunch of problems. They're applications of Bitcoin that solve problems that impair adoption. One problem that they solve is convenience. There are a lot of people where like you could pick up the phone and say, I want you to buy $22 million of Bitcoin over the next six hours at the average VWAP price. And you're going to execute that in, I don't know, 5,000 individual transactions. You can do that in 10 seconds with uh, an ETF and without putting up any money, you know. Whereas before the ETFs, that would have taken six months to set up all those accounts and you'd have to sit at your computer. And the people that can actually do that of the money, they don't have the computer skills. Right? You know, you're 22, you can probably trade it at a computer. When you're 73 years old and you've got the 20 million bucks, you can do this. Hey, Bob, buy $20 million worth of Bitcoin via iBit, click. That's what you can do. So they solve the convenience problem, they solve the access problem, but they also solve um, um, a custody problem. That person doesn't want a custody. You know, the 65-year-old person, they don't, they don't want a custody. Like, like I don't want to be kidnapped. Yeah. You think that I, you know, you think that I want to go on television and say, yeah, yeah, I saw, I have all my Bitcoin. It's like, you know, in this key around my neck here, please don't kidnap me, right? I mean, those people don't, you know, you want to have it with an institutional custodian, right? And so it solves the problem of custody, but then it solves the third problem, which is compliance and capital controls. <clears throat> um, there are a lot of companies, let's take Millennium, right? They have $2 billion of Bitcoin via IBIT, uh, via these ETFs, $2 billion, okay? They couldn't buy the underlying Bitcoin if they wanted to, they don't by their charter, it wouldn't, it wouldn't meet their compliance rules. So they can either buy $2 billion worth of wrapped Bitcoin or they can buy zero. It's very black and white, 2 billion, zero. You could, you know, you can be obvious and say, well, blah, blah, they should just, they should set up the account and set up their own keys and do it because if they don't, they're stupid, but they're not stupid. They have more money than you have, right? I mean, they have infinitely more money than everybody that criticizes them. They must not be that stupid, right? They're pretty smart, right? They make huge amounts of money. Anybody that can accumulate tens of billions of dollars of capital probably isn't, you know, has something going for them. They simply have a system where their compliance controls and their charter are such that they can trade on a certain set of exchange in a certain way. And if you do business the way they do business, do it their way, you get the billion dollar order. You do it your way, you get the zero dollar order, right? That's another lesson of sales. The customer is right, do business the way the customer wants to do it. And now let's go to this last point, capital control. How's Bitcoin gonna scale? Well, in China, Bitcoin is gonna scale via an ETF in Shanghai that allows you to buy wrapped Bitcoin, which will be custodied by a bank in Shanghai, regulated by and overseen by the Chinese government. The Chinese will embrace Bitcoin. They just don't embrace the ability for any individual to take it out of their country. Right? Sometimes we get, <clears throat> we confuse two objectives. Do you want, you know, are, are you in favor of Bitcoin being successful? Or are you in favor of eliminating capital controls in the world? You see, this is a political objective. You know, you might feel that you disagree with the Chinese policy, which is you should not be able to move more than $50,000 a year out of China. You disagree with that policy. But that's not the same as wanting Bitcoin to be successful. Are you against the Chinese government or, or their law, or are you in favor of Bitcoin? So, you know, if you insist that 
I have to be able to buy non-KYC Bitcoin in China and custody it myself and move it you know, where I want and not report it to the Chinese government. You see, you've signed up to a much more ambitious agenda, right? I'm in favor of complete sovereignty of the individual, complete privacy, complete freedom to transact and Bitcoin. Okay, fine. It is China. <laughs> There's 1.5 billion people in it, right? And so the question is, are you likely to get them to change that policy in the next 12 months or 12 years? You know, you can try to get a country to change their policy. It's called revolution. If you have enough guns and you want to topple, if you want to fight and die for what you believe, you can be a Castro or a Stalin or a Mao or a Ho Chi Minh or fill in the blank, put in your favorite revolutionary. You can do it, but on the other hand, if you just want Bitcoin to be successful, when you hear the Bank of Shanghai is rolling out a Bitcoin ETF custody to the Bank of Shanghai, you would say, that's great. That's going to give access to Bitcoin to 1.5 billion people in China, okay? And they're going to buy a bunch of Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin is going to go up to $10 million coin. So here's the question. Do you want the billion people in China to be rich? And do you want to be rich while the Chinese government still has a bunch of laws that you may or may not agree with? Or do you want the people in China to be poor and you to be poor while the Chinese government has a set of laws that you don't agree with? Pretty easy. Or do you think that you're so great, you're Superman, that you can just go and topple the entire government by barking on Twitter? It's like... I. You know, I just don't think, right, that that you're going to topple, you know, an entire sovereign nation with your ideology. So how is Bitcoin scale, right? Bitcoin scales in layers and it's, you know, it scales when 100,000 banks custody Bitcoin. It scales with hundreds or thousands of ETFs. It scales when every technology company builds Bitcoin into their mobile app. It scales <clears throat> with a lot of a lot of uh, Bitcoin OG maxis at the base layer that hold their own keys. But even so, you put five in a room and let them debate what's their favorite signing device. They'll go back and forth, right? Multi sig, single sig, you know how you know what's your succession plan? You know, should you give your husband or your wife, you know, your private keys? What about your kids? When do you give, the, you know, it's like, there's a lot of stuff to be worked out. So ultimately, <clears throat> all adoption is good for Bitcoin, right? The, every single company that embraces Bitcoin is good. When, uh, when BlackRock embraces Bitcoin and they launch the IBIT ETF, what did they do? They drive up the price of Bitcoin and create hundreds of billions of dollars of wealth for everybody else. What else did they do? They created a massive demand for self-custody in the banking system. You know, a lot of people say, not your keys, not your coin, right? Well, what about the, what if the banks want to keep their own keys? Like, like for example, if you're in favor of being able to, to keep your own keys, then why would you deny a corporation the ability to keep their keys? A bank is a sort of corporation and they provide custody service for people as a business. So why can't they have their keys? Why can't they have Bitcoin? So there's a rule called SAB 121. <clears throat> and SAB 121 was put in place by the SEC and the US and it, and it effectively prohibits banks in the United States from custodying Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And when all the ETFs got approved, all of the Wall Street firms started lobbying to have SAB 121 repealed because they want all those banks to be able to custody their Bitcoin because they'd like to do business with State Street and BNY Mellon and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. So here you see an example of of uh, an organization adopts Bitcoin in a way that isn't a purist idea. And that organization lobbies for a better regulatory framework to get other organizations to start self-custodying Bitcoin. 
And those organizations, they, they then go and they get everybody in the Senate and everybody in the Congress to vote to repeal the law. So the individualist who doesn't believe in a corporation, who doesn't trust banks, who doesn't trust companies, that person probably doesn't have the influence to convince the, to convince the Senate, the House, you know, the banking lobby, you know, to vote to repeal a rule that prevents other corporations from custodying Bitcoin. So I think there's just a very rich dynamic. And when, when I look at Bitcoin, I don't, I, I think it's a mistake to think the network is only scaled if people are nodes, right? One, one, uh, one conventional model people have, which I think leads them astray, is that when they think about the network, they only think of people like themselves. Everybody is like, like just people like me. Well, why not corporations as nodes? What, what about family? What, you know, what about when there's 10 people in a family? Well, is that 10 nodes? Is, has it failed if there's one person that has the money for the other nine? Well, what if the nine are kids between the ages of zero and eight? Why can't one person have the keys for the 10 kids, right? And if that's the case, then why not a community church? Why not a football club? You know, why, why can't the football club have their keys? You know, why can't a city? Why can't a company? Why can't a bank, right? If, if banks hold, hold money in trust for people that are not even alive yet, and they're a trustee, and there's a there's a reason why not. So I think um, the network is more decentralized when there are a lot of corporations that are custodying Bitcoin, right? And it's a it's a counterintuitive idea. Most people think custodians are a bad thing. They want non-custodial. Well, wait a minute, you're a custodian, right? Why why is it? If you're a better custodian than a professional custodian, does that make you a better dentist than your dentist? And does that make you a better doctor than your doctor? And does that make you a better airline pilot than the guy in front of the airplane right now? Since you're, I mean, why not just take this to the extreme, right? If, why don't you operate on yourself, right? So I, I, I think... The early crypto community had these bad experiences with crappy fly-by-night exchanges and unreliable custodians, and it caused them to decide, not your keys, not your coin. But I don't think that's the right lesson for the next decade. I think the right next lesson for the next decade is you should have everybody, you should have a situation where everybody in the world is able to custody Bitcoin. Every country, every company, every institution, every family, every individual, every entity, and even, and even non-persons. Like, what about an AI? What if you release an artificial intelligence? Why can't they custody? So in that world, things are a lot richer. You're like, well, I don't trust a company. Well, I mean, that's stupid. You do trust a company. Every, you know, you were probably born in a hospital where a doctor didn't drop you on your head and kill you. So everybody trusts something, right? You trust the company to generate the electricity that makes the internet work. And, and so it's really a question of, are we going to power up the entire world with digital energy, right? It's, it's, you know, it's not just for individuals, it's for everybody and everything. And, um, you know, I make one last point on this subject, which is if you're an individual and you hold Bitcoin in self-custody in uh, Austria, you're safer if the Bank of England and a bank in Italy and, the, and an EU central bank and the Fed and a bank of China all hold Bitcoin. Right, You're, because if you want to protect the individual from the crushing power of the nation state, when your government decides to take it away from you, or or when whatever the local bank decides to take it away from you, your best protector is their competitor. You really want 
the Bank of China to hold Bitcoin, they will protect you from a, a, a powerful entity in the U.S. You want the U.S. to hold Bitcoin to protect you against the Russian government. You want the Russian government to hold Bitcoin. So you want governments to have Bitcoin. You want banks to have Bitcoin. You want large corporations. Apple Computer will protect you from being victimized by Microsoft and Google if they decide to, you know, to impair your Bitcoin, right? Maybe Google puts some secret thing and they prevent, you know, prevent you from using Bitcoin freely and their competitor offers you a better solution. Integrity, integrity is achieved and security is achieved through balance of power, through the balance of power of entities more powerful than you, right? Ultimately, you know, it's, you can't do it yourself. You need, you need mega corps that are mega powerful, but you need more than one. And ideally, you have a bunch of them in competition with each other. When I look at Bitcoin, I think, huh, you know, Hal Finney said maybe the destiny of Bitcoin is to be a, a, high, a, a settlement network for high-powered money connecting Bitcoin banks, you know. If you read his early work there, right, eventually it's a bunch of Bitcoin banks and they're settling with each other a hundred million or a billion dollars at a time. And then they're all doing all these individual transactions. But, um, you know, I, I look at the Bitcoin and I look at how it's evolving and I think about, I think about this, uh, this vision and, it occurs to me that the existing banking system is 50,000 banks all primarily capitalized on the dollar, right? The Chinese currency is pegged to the dollar. The Middle East currency is pegged to the dollar. The euro is effectively pegged to the dollar. The dollar is pegged to the dollar, right? So you've either got something effectively pegged to the dollar or you've got something collapsing, right? Mm. So the entire world banking system is effectively pegged to uh, a fiat asset, the dollar, which is collapsing, whatever, seven to 10% a year. And it's all cleared through one node, right? One central node. And people understand why that's not a good idea but I think it's a mistake to conclude, oh, and therefore banking is bad. The problem is not banking. The problem is you have a, a, a single uh, toxic capital asset and a fragile centralized network. Imagine a world where 50,000 banks all used Bitcoin as the capital asset and they cleared peer to peer with each other. And so I replaced a defective, a defective fiat capital uh, structure with a, a perfect monetary structure called Bitcoin. And I, re I replaced a network that cleared through a single node or a very fragile set of correspondent banks. And I replaced that with 50,000 banks clearing peer to peer. And then hang on that network 500,000 big companies and then put below that network hang 50 million institutions and then plug into that a billion families and then step back and ask yourself the question, does that feel better or worse than what we have right now in the Bitcoin system? And is that better or worse than what we have right now in the fiat system? It feels to me like it's a lot better than the fiat system, right? You know, if you, if you went to the guy that runs the Bank of Australia or the Bank of Austria or the Bank of China or the Bank of whatever, you said, how would you like to have an asset which doesn't lose 7 to 10% of its value every year? And how would you like to be able to settle with any other bank in the world peer to peer? And I, it's an upgrade for them, right? So it's an upgrade to the existing system. And then if you look at the Bitcoin system, it's like, what if I said to you as a Bitcoiner, 
you don't have to worry about your nation state attacking you if you're Chinese because the Americans will protect you. And you don't have to worry if you're Russian about the Russians attacking Bitcoin because the Chinese and the American and the Indians and the Europeans are going to protect the network. And if I went to a European and said, you don't have to worry about your country taking away your Bitcoin because the Americans will disagree and the Chinese will disagree and everybody else will disagree. If that was the case, then I think you achieve a much greater degree of security and sovereignty. And all of these entities that enter the party, that join the network, they're not making it worse. They're making it better for you, for everybody. And they're, and they're entering into a new world. And so maybe, maybe banks don't have to be crappy, right? Maybe we can have good banks, right? If, if we're going to sit and rail about the problem of using fiat as a store of value, we might stop and pause and say, well, maybe if I ran an institution where I'm required by the regulator to use a defective store of value, maybe that's my problem. And if this is an alternative, maybe we can introduce a solution that will allow them to recapitalize with a better technology. And, and then you're just left with the question of, you know, is the institution useful to the world or not? And the free market will decide that. Some banks don't provide any value and they'll disappear. But there are, cert there are certainly companies that do things that we like done. Maybe the future biggest bank in the world is Apple Computer. And Apple is going to give us easy to use safe multi-sig that six-year-olds can figure out. And I don't know. But I, it seems to me that Bitcoin is going to scale with the help of all the big companies, with the help of all the big banks, with the help of all the governments, with the help of, of every innovator and every entrepreneur. Everybody has a role to play in this. I think we should welcome them all. And you might have an opinion. You might be, might be thinking, well, I hate that or I don't like that or I don't like that. Well, it's the free market. You're one person. Are you smarter than the collective intelligence of 8 billion people over the next 100 years, including all the 8 trillion AIs that are about to get spun off? Do you think you're smarter than that? And I think... I think what Bitcoin teaches you is humility to say, no, you're not smarter than everybody else in the human race. You're certainly not smarter than everyone in the human race that's yet to be born. So chill out and let humanity do its thing and let Bitcoin do its thing because it's working pretty well so far. And I think it'll keep working. Uh, I, I love it a lot, uh, what, what you just said. Um, and I have a thousand questions, but uh, we have to come to the end routine uh, of the podcast. And we have a special end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who actually is the next guest. And I found that question so suiting for you, uh, which brings in a whole, maybe a whole new topic. Uh, what is the one thing uh, that you have uh, that is really important for you that you could not buy with money? A mission, a mission, right? <laughs> right? Uh, uh, the Bitcoin mission, right? That's, that's very important to me. The opportunity to, to make a contribution to the human race by introducing and advocating this new idea. And uh, before Satoshi, I didn't have that. And after Satoshi, I have that. And uh, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. It gives, a mission gives life meaning. I love it a lot. And I usually ask my guests uh, before I end the podcast uh, to to shout out their their channels, but I've, I think everybody already knows you and everybody already follows you. Uh, so I just end with like a thank you. And that's the one question, uh, the one input from my community uh, that I got a lot. I should say thank you to you uh, for taking the time to actually um, make the Bitcoin adoption drive. And this is a really cool uh, mission and uh, extremely uh, great that we have you on our Bitcoin team and we appreciate that a lot. So thank you, Michael. And I think I can speak for uh, some of my communities uh, when I say thank you for that. Thanks for the opportunity. 
Perfect, then uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.